the congressional plan, there still needs to be a little bit of work on that. It became more likely Monday evening that the decision on congressional redistricting wouldn't be decided until the new legislative session opens in the state house in January. This is the state Senate and House still need to make official proposals for what the new districts might look like. Prep work has been done. There's been hearings across the state. Some of that prep work seen here. Senate subcommittee submitted this proposal with additions critics have called gerrymandering. Congressional seats six and one represented by Congressman Jim Clyburn and Congresswoman Nancy Mace drew most of the questioning. The proposal would put the University of South Carolina and the College of Charleston, two colleges more than 100 miles away and known for their Democrat voting base into the Democrat at Clyburn's district while taking many of those voters out of District 1, seemingly making it more likely to stay red. The proposal would also split the Charleston Peninsula into two parts. Gerrymandering is in the eye of the beholder, and we have a constitutional duty to redraw the lines. And the Supreme Court's been very clear that partisan makeup um, and partisan considerations is certainly something that can factor into drawing the lines. I'm sure if Joe Cunningham uh, was emperor, he would draw the lines differently. Joe Cunningham, a Democrat running for governor who used to represent District 1, has been a critic of the proposal and took exception to Groom's comments. Look, I think that attitude from Mr. Groom's represents everything that's wrong with politics. It represents everything that people hate about politics. I won, so I'm going to draw lines. I'm going to draw lines to pick my constituents instead of allowing constituents to pick me. I asked Cunningham if the shoe was on the other foot and the Democrats controlled the state house if he would feel the same way. If it had been on the flip side and the Democrats were in charge and a similar map came out in the other direction, would you still uh, say this is a the wrong thing to do, that this would should be something that's more even according to population? Hell yeah, I would. Absolutely. At, because I, I, do, I firmly believe that, you know, this isn't a Democrat, in my mind, this isn't a Democrat versus a Republican. This is a matter of, of fair elections. And do Democrats do it in other states? Do Republicans do it in other states? Yes. I live in South Carolina, so here's where I fight. I fight where I stand. For Senator Grooms, he says state Republicans are doing their job. We're going to equalize the population of the South Carolina House districts and the congress congressional map. Well, work to clean up a mess in Mount Pleasant, Shem Creek just stopped when the sun went down. A shrimp boat sank, and we're learning about some quick decisions to protect the environment. Our Tara Jabora reports on the actions taken and tells us how the sinking is affecting the boat owner. A shrimp boat here right by Geechee Seafood started sinking overnight, leading to 50 to 100 gallons of fuel spilling into Shem Creek. My fiance called me this morning and said, babe, the, the, the boat is sunk and it, it's we're both very distraught. The boat Hampton Caroline is named after the owner's fiance. This is our livelihood and this is what's going to put food on our table. Put a lot of hard work and money into this boat to bring it back to its original glory. The owner of the boat is a relative of the owner of Geechee Seafood. The boat was going to help the business, but now that may change. All we had to do on this boat was put the outriggers on and some more electronics and throw the nets on and she was ready to go. Um, we were trying to get her ready for the next season. 50 to 100 gallons of fuel spilled into Shem Creek. The Coast Guard, Mount Pleasant Fire Department, and two other agencies worked to remove all of the fuel. We're working on pumping as much of the fuel out of the water as we can. Uh, we're using sorbent material, uh, both sorbent boom and sorbent pads to try and soak up as much of that fuel as we can. Um, and then there is some natural remediation that occurs with the um, weather and the tide. The Coast Guard says there is a risk of an environmental impact, but the work they do to remove the fuel will mitigate that risk. The family is also concerned about the water. We obviously care about it because it brings food to our table, you know? I mean, everything runs full circle and we care very much, very much about the environment. The pages are hoping to recover the boat and get things back on track for business. I just pray to God that things go as planned. Um, this is one of those things that you just don't expect to happen. Meanwhile, COVID vaccinations in South Carolina kids are inching upwards. DHEC says 8.3% of children 5 to 11 have gotten at least one dose, and that's up a little under a percentage point from the previous report, but it's still a low number. Our Natalie Spala set out to learn why more kids aren't getting vaccinated and what's being done to make the process easier. There was a movie years ago about building a baseball field and the team would come. Well, I think people are trying the opposite. If we ignore it, it'll go away. 
And unfortunately, that's not going to work. Working towards a solution, one tiny arm at a time. Dr. Valerie Scott, a family physician with Roper St. Francis Healthcare, says she's seen a slow uptick in the number of 5 to 11 year olds coming in to receive the vaccine. I think that the parents have been delaying some of these vaccines just because of all the other things going on in their life. Just one of the reasons why she says the state's vaccination numbers for this group trail the rest of the country. Most of these kids are very active in school uh, and are in school during the day. So it's uh, hard for their parents to get them, you know, for the vaccine. But that's not all. COVID fatigue, the busy holiday season, and the desire to wait and see all playing a role, according to Scott, even with the newest variant. Omicron was just noted about three weeks ago. So it's very premature for anyone to say anything about how it's going to behave. But it's real. And, you know, this vaccine will really put us ahead in being able to deal with any variant that comes around. With questions still yet to be answered, Dr. Scott says we must focus on what we do know. The vaccine is our ticket for a wonderful 2022. And in particular, let's get our children vaccinated, but all ages need to go ahead and get the vaccine. Now, in order to make it easier for parents to get their child vaccinated, Roper does offer vaccines at their express care clinics. Those are open seven days a week.